I'm Ryan Szymanski, Curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we're going to talk about the evolution of shipboard propulsion. The earliest ships were powered by oars. Well, one could say that the earliest ships were logs that people got astride and paddled with their hands. But soon after that, people started stringing logs together to make actual vessels and using oars or poles to move those vessels, depending on whether they were in shallow or deep water. Uh, the oar system probably lasted longer on warships than any other system we'll talk about so far. Uh, the entire ancient history of the world is oar-powered galley-type warships uh, ramming each other. So, oars were the main propulsive system for much of human history. Fairly early on, though, sailors started supplementing their oars with sails. Most ships only had one, maybe two sails in ancient times, and it wasn't until uh, much later, when you start to get into the hundreds or thousands AD, where you start to see multi-sail ships show up. These modes of propulsion were much more common in merchant vessels, because it required less sailors to sail a ship than it did to oar, uh, row them with oars. Now, oar-powered vessels, uh, for example, an ancient trireme might have as many as 300 rowers, on board. This gave them constant propulsion in combat, and they were not limited by the waves, but of course it's a huge expenditure of manpower. Once you get into the uh, first millennia AD, start to get into the, the thousands, especially going up towards the uh, 13, 14, 1500s, use, harnessing wind power became more scientific. And humans were able to uh, record and remember when, what times of years the winds sort of tended to blow in certain directions, uh, which isn't to say that ancient sailors hadn't figured this out. However, as ships got larger and became too heavy to reliably row, they started adding taller and taller masts with more and more sails, uh, and so they became fully dependent on sail power, uh, especially during open ocean work. Some restricted waterways, like the Mediterranean in particular, continued to use oar-powered galleys uh, even into the age of cannons. But by the 16 and 1700s, the sailing ship was the way to go. And this early sailing ships were fueled the age of discovery and then grew in size as European powers used the wealth of the New World to build larger standing militaries. So by the late 1700s, you have large fleets of sail powered warships. These ships rolled the waves up until the early 1800s when steam power started to take over. It took a hold on land first with trains, and some early ships got auxiliary steam power, uh, mostly modified train engines. Uh, and the military really led the way with this, as they do with most new technology. Like I said, early steamships use the steam as an auxiliary. With a sail-powered ship, you can sail forever. It's extremely green. With a uh, train engine powered ship, you have to shovel coal into it to burn, to boil water, to harness that steam. Now steam uh, is still used on ships up till today. Initially, steam was used to power paddle wheels built into the sides of the ship. Uh, for warships, 
this is an extremely vulnerable arrangement because they tend to get broadside with enemies and fire guns through the side of the ship, so you're limiting where you can have guns. And any hit to that paddle wheel destroys part of your propulsion. So fairly early on from there, uh, paddle wheels gave way to propellers. Uh, early propellers were designed to be retractable, so they wouldn't create drag when the ship was under sail power. But as steam engines became more and more uh, economical, as European countries conquered more and more territory to set up coaling stations around the world, uh, these propellers became more and more permanent. And by the late 1800s, early 1900s, Many coastal warships were built without sails at all, and ocean-going ships were only using sails for auxiliary power. Uh, the U.S. Navy built its last auxiliary sail-powered ships in the 1890s. Uh, even the cruiser Olympia, moored across the river from us, was originally designed with auxiliary sails. Um, these didn't really help too much with propulsion, and they only supplemented her coal-fired uh, triple expansion steam engines. But they were there nonetheless for a couple of years, and then they were replaced, and the United States then had a series of colonies all across the Pacific so that they could set up coaling stations so that they no longer needed sails. Uh, in the years leading up to World War I, the first uh, triple expansion steam engines started to be replaced by turbines. Uh, with a turbine, instead of the steam going into a cylinder and expanding as it cooled down um, to move pistons or something like that, they started blowing the steam over impeller blades that were set to a central shaft that was attached to the propeller shaft. So these steam turbine vessels, like HMS Dreadnought, built in 1906, which was the first capital ship-sized turbine power vessel, coupled their turbines directly to their propellers. This was not immediately accepted around the world, and it was about a decade later before the first American ships started being designed with turbines. Um, but this, this was a much more efficient way, and uh, the, the newest generation of battleships would be built with turbines. And eventually, regular steam turbines gave way to geared turbines in battleship construction. Uh, this was by adding a gear reduction box between the turbines with the impeller blades and the propeller shafts themselves. So the steam hits the impeller blades and spins them at thousands of revolutions per minute. That is much too fast for a propeller. Battleship New Jersey's propellers were most efficient around 200 revolutions per minute. If you start spinning them faster than that, it causes cavitation, which is air bubbles forming on the propeller shafts, uh, the propeller blades. And that makes a lot of noise and you're losing a lot of your efficiency that way. So the gear reduction box is a set of variably or different sized gears, which will step down the thousands of rotations of the turbines down to the hundreds of rotations that your propellers need. Up into World War I, ships were still being powered by coal. And at this time, the first oil fired uh, battleships started to enter service. At first, some nations were just using oil fire to supplement their coal-fired boilers. With coal-fired ships, you have to physically shovel the coal into the ship. It creates a lot of coal dust, there's a lot of ash you have to get rid of after the fact. Uh, so oil-fired ships requires more work to get the oil, but it's more efficient on a ship. Uh, and the rate at which various countries adopted oil fire had to do with how much oil they were able to produce. So the United States pretty rapidly switched over to oil firing all of its existing ships 
or all of its new built ships and retrofitting existing ships with oil firing turbines immediately after World War I. Uh, countries like Great Britain started building new ships with oil fire, but because Great Britain produces much more coal than oil, they continued to use coal firing ships for a while. Uh, Imperial Germany at the same time didn't have much oil, so they tended to continue to build coal-fired ships, which also had a couple of oil-fired burners. They also started exploring the idea of combining uh, steam boilers with new, more efficient diesel engines. And during World War I, this didn't really work out. Uh, by World War II, there were efficient diesel engines which were equipping uh, many warships such as submarines, and Germany even managed to equip their pocket battleships uh, with diesel engines, which gave them much greater range and agility than steam turbine ships. So steam turbines continued to be the main propulsion system of many warships, even as diesel engines were introduced However, the pressures at which these steam turbines operated continued to go up and up and up. So, some early steamships operated on 200, 300 pounds of pressure, uh, went up to 400. Battleship New Jersey operated at 600. And then by the, the immediate post-war era, the United States was building warships with 1,200 pound steam plants. Modern ships do not use steam turbines anymore, however. A couple of different things uh, are being used, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, in the United States and Soviet Union primarily, there are a lot of ships which are nuclear powered. These vessels use the nuclear reaction to boil water into steam. Uh, and so they operate very similarly to Battleship New Jersey in that the steam is turning turbines, which is powering the ship, uh, just instead of heating oil to boil water, they're using nuclear fission to boil water. Uh, many smaller warships, like destroyers and cruisers, are powered by gas turbines, and this is a more efficient, high-speed uh, type setup that is very common in the United States Navy. Uh, other navies have been experimenting with combining multiple types of propulsion, uh, and even the United States Coast Guard has attempted this with their 378 class cutters in combining uh, a diesel propulsion with gas turbines. So the diesel is run when you need to be efficient, and the gas turbines are run when you need to have higher speed. And other countries and with different types of ships have experimented with uh, different combinations. The fact that the U.S. Navy no longer uses steam turbine ships is one of the reasons why we probably will never see Battleship New Jersey return to service. How do you cut through the 6-inch armored deck or the 12-inch armored belt to replace our eight boilers and four turbine units with newer systems? It would cost more than to build a new ship. Uh, and where do you find trained sailors who know how to use those sorts of systems? They just aren't around anymore. So, Battleship New Jersey is probably safe as a museum for the rest of her career. If you would like to support the Battleship New Jersey, there are some links in the description down below to our store uh, and also to our donate page. Um, remember to check back in every day for more content here and on our other social media sites. Uh, and remember to like, share, and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you know when we're posting new content.